So hello again, everyone, and welcome to another exciting lecture of Math 140 Business. This is our 10th lecture since last time was a review day. Uh, and we are going to start chapter nine, which is a pretty short and relatively straightforward chapter. So we'll probably move on and do some of 11, which for some reason tends to cause people lots of difficulty. Um, I love the subject of probability, but a lot of people that I know, even, even really good people in math, they tend to um, they tend to struggle with it. So I guess it's looking at things a little differently than you normally would. Um, but we'll get there. We'll see how we do. So let's do chapter nine. Chapter nine is on um, observation versus experiments. Observation versus experiments. But before we do it, um, I'm just going to pause for a quick second. Okay, so we're back. Okay, so first, what is the difference between an observation and an experiment? Um, sometimes you want to. Uh, sometimes you want to analyze something, and you're not really in a position that either time or money or even ethics allows you to, to do. For example, does anyone here believe that if pregnant women smoke or drink, that might cause long lasting effects in their unborn children? Anyone here, huh? Yeah, I believe that. Right, you believe that, right? So let's do an experiment. I'm gonna take 100 pregnant women, and I'm going to have 50 of them smoke and drink and 50 of them not smoke and drink. And then years later, we'll look at their kids and we'll compare them and, and, and see what happens. Does that seem like a, a well thought out experiment to you? No. Oh, no, probably not. So it's, you can't really do that one. But what I can do is go to the hospital and find women who do smoke and drink while pregnant because there are some and make a record of their children and then possibly follow their children over the next few years and observe aspects of their, of their development and personality and compare it to other children whose mothers do not smoke and drink. That's a difference between an actual experiment where I actually do something and an observation or an observational study <clears throat> where I can still get information but it's just by observing without actively taking a part. So, so experiment is more like controlled in a way? And yes, an experiment is very is controls. An experiment, um, you you play a role and actually differentiate your subjects in some way. You give these people some treatment and these ones not, or vi or or something. Where yes, in an observational study, there's no control whatsoever. You are just observing the results that would have occurred even if you weren't there. Okay. Okay. Um, so just to, to write it out, an observational study, an observational study uh, observes individuals, observes individuals, and measures variables of interest, and measures variables of interest, uh, but does not attempt, but does not attempt to influence the responses. An experiment, on the other hand, an experiment deliberately deliberate delib, deliber how the hell do you spell this word deliver deliberate 
That looks good, right? Yeah. Deliberately imposes some treatments on individuals. Uh, to observe the responses. As a general rule, experiments are better, but as we saw, sometimes you just can't always do it. Okay? Makes sense, the difference between an observational study and an experiment, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Next definition. So this chapter is very non-mathematical, just lots of definitions. Two variables are confounded. Two variables are confounded when their effects on a response variable cannot be distinguished, cannot be distinguished. From each other. So for example, you know, as an example of confounded variables, um, if we're looking at heart disease, um, you know, drinking habits um, affects heart disease. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Um, and diet and lifestyle affects heart disease, correct? Yes. So, if I'm doing an experiment and their drinking habits and their diet and lifestyle both change from person to person, I might have a difficult time determining the cause if there is one of heart disease because these two variables are confounded. Their effects on the, on the response variable might be difficult to be distinguished. Okay, so that's a very straightforward example of confounded variables. Make sense so far? Yes. All right, okay. Okay, next, more definitions, because they like definitions. The individuals, the individuals in an experiment are often called, the subjects of the experiment. The explanatory variables, the explanatory variables in an experiment are often are often called factors All right factors the reasons why something might occur are they a factor this is like a term from english right is something a factor so the explanatory variables are often called factors a treatment a treatment in an experiment is a condition applied to the subjects. So for example, um, if I'm testing a new drug, then I might give the drug to some of the people, some of the individuals, some of the subjects, and then I might give a placebo, a fake drug, to some of them. 
to see whether or not there's an actual physical response. If everyone thinks they're getting the drug, whether they are or not, maybe there's a psychological reason why they're getting better, right? Do you guys imagine if somebody thinks they're getting medicine, they might get better even if they're not actually getting the medicine? Yeah. Okay, so the idea of a placebo is that you don't know if it's real or not. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. And if we can see a noticeable statistical difference between the ones who are getting it and the ones who aren't, then we might be in a position, a position to conclude that the drug is actually effective. So the different treatments are the different conditions opposed on the subjects. Again, um, these are probably terms that you've seen before or heard before, right? If you watch Grey's Anatomy, like, you know, I'm sure you all do because you know, it's a great show. You've probably all heard these terms before, right? Anyone? Someone? Bueller? I've heard I've, of the show. You've heard of the show. You've heard of the show. That show, sorry. What was that? Started it, but didn't finish. Wait, what is that? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Grey's Anatomy. Grey didn't like it. It's lame. It got boring after a few seasons. A few seasons. I couldn't keep up. I hear you. I would assume. What season are they on? I think they're on like the 18th. <laughs> I don't okay, know. Too, way too that. far. You know, actually, I can tell you right now. It's on my spreadsheet. Let's take a look. Grey's Anatomy is on the 18th season. Yeah. So it might be older than some of you are even alive. That's crazy. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. To be young again. 18 seasons. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. All right. Anywho, next section. Bruh. Yeah. Okay. Next, next section. How to experiment badly. How to experiment badly. There's actually a section in the book. How to experiment badly. So they're trying to teach us how? I think they're more inclined to teach you what not to do than it is to teach you what you should do. It gives you something to watch for months though. Well, if you want to watch something, I have much better shows for you to watch for months. I mean, not even months, weeks. I've watched a lot of shows. I watch a lot of shows. Anyways, how to experiment badly. Um, essentially, when you experiment, you want three things to occur. Um, so when you perform, when you, uh, um, when you perform an experiment, you strive for three things. Watch Supernatural. Watch Supernatural. I've heard of it. I've heard of it, but it's not on my list. First thing, control. First thing, control. Strive to eliminate confounding, and lurking variables. When you do an experiment, you don't wanna have any confusion as to what, why the response is what it is. Eliminate confounding and eliminate lurking variables, things that are going on behind the scenes. The, the more you can eliminate, the better. Strive, strive. Next. Randomization, randomization. Stri uh, always, always assign treatments to subjects randomly. Okay, everyone should get a treatment based purely on randomization. Never on 
Oh, well, that's a nice shirt you're wearing today. So let's give you this drug. Or, oh, you're tall. So let's do this. It should always be random. And the last one is replication. The more subjects, the more accurate the analysis should be. So when you perform an experiment, you strive for these things. How do you experiment badly? By not doing these things. So if you have confounding or lurking variables, bad. If you don't randomize your treatments, bad. If you don't have a large sample, bad. So how to experiment badly? So how do you experiment badly? Don't have some or don't have one of these three, one or more of these three um, properties. Do those three seem natural and intuitive and make sense? Yes. We all agree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Next definition, randomized comparative experiments. Can you go back? Yeah, I'll give you guys a second to, uh, to copy this. No problem. While you're doing that, I'll just say that if you haven't watched Lost, you're certainly missing out on just the greatest TV show of all time. What do you sound pretty lost? Huh? What do you sound pretty lost if I don't watch? No, I said if you haven't watched Lost, you're missing out on the greatest TV show of all time. Have you watched Manifest? I have watched Manifest, and it really jumped the shark in the third season. Right, yeah. I felt by the time that I mean, I'm like, oh my god, end already, end, end, and then it ended, and I was so happy. And then they renewed it anyways for a fourth season, and now I have to watch that because my OCD is going to require me to finish it. But it's crazy weird at this point. That's just my opinion, though. You know, take it for a grain of salt. Anyways, I'm guessing, I'm uh -huh. guessing you watched the watch the Squid Games already. I, I I watched it this weekend. Yeah, yeah. It was. I really like it. Oh, I enjoyed it. Although the acting was a little bad at times, I felt, but I enjoyed it. Um, but a lot of holes in it, though, and things that they didn't answer, which I don't want to say because you know people are still uh, possibly watching it. It just did come out, and I don't, I don't even give spoilers or anything like that. You should watch Alice in the Borderland if you like that. Wait, I should watch what? Alice in the Borderland. It's on Netflix too. Alice and the Borderland. In the Borderland. Could you I'll put it in chat, please, so I know what you just said. If that's okay. Oh my god, I'm watching that right now. I'm like on episode like five. Wait, yeah, you're watching that right now while I teach. You're watching that? No, no. I'm maybe I'm not watching it right now. Where you're teaching? You me. literally said really right now. Episode. You literally said right now. No, I mean like I mean like I'm watching it like between like in between your class. Oh. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I believe you. Anyways, what thoughts on The Wire? Ooh, The Wire. The Wire. The Wire was a good show. And rest in peace to Omar, who just passed away a few weeks ago. All right, randomized comparative experiments. Okay, this is, this is an experiment. This is an experiment that uses both comparison of multiple treatments and random assignments of subjects to treatments. 
we like, we really like randomized comparative experiments because you're randomly assigning the subjects to treatments. We have randomization. We assume that you have replication. We assume that you have control. But the idea is that you are comparing multiple treatments and you are randomly assigning the subjects to those treatments. A randomized comparative experiment. We love them. It's in the top 10 on P sure. What does P mean? Pretty sure. Oh, pretty sure. What Alice in the Borderland is? Yeah, I'm pretty sure like a few days ago when I was watching Squid Game, it was like- Oh, great. Just something else I gotta watch now. Uh, it's been out for a while though. I, I remember hearing about it like a couple months ago. I think they're gonna come out with a new season in like, I think in a year or two. Well, that's what happens. It's called word of mouth, right? The things that are really popular, people talk about them and pass it on and it just blows up. And then sooner or later, everyone's watching it. And then now I have to dress up like a circle or a triangle or a square for Halloween. So, you know, it just- it's Those just, masks it's look pretty cool, effect. by the way. Huh? Masks that they're making look pretty cool with that. Well, my, uh, I have a friend, one of my fellow teachers at the high school. They're all about, uh, where is it here? I don't know. I don't know where it went. But they're all about what we're doing for Halloween. And now we all have to dress up that way. Here it is. Ah, oh, whatever. I can't find it. Anyways. So, yeah. That's uh, going to be a lot of fun. Okay, next. A completely... A completely randomized design, a completely randomized design is a method to assign subjects to treatments randomly. Now, we already spoke about what a design is in general. A design is a method to do something. A probability model or, or a, a experimental design is a method of performing the experiment. So a completely randomized design is a method to assign subjects to treatments randomly. Of course, what's the best type? The best type is uh, a random number generator, an SRS. So there's pure randomness and everyone is just as likely as anyone else to end up in any treatment. Okay. Um, again, this subject, this chapter, very, very non-mathematical, very uh, wordy, just definitions and recognizing um, the concepts. We don't even really apply this stuff much in later chapters. It's just be aware that they exist. And of course, you know, on tests, know what the definitions are but as soon as we get to chapter 11 which is the next chapter you'll never need any of this stuff again so it's very limited to just what we're doing and then and then we move on the next definition on the other hand is a definition that we're going to use for the entire remainder of the course and this is really really important so if you haven't been paying attention yet certainly start now okay <clears throat> Suppose I were to flip a coin one time. If you were to guess what you think I'm going to get, what would you say? A fair coin, one flip. 50-50 chance you get heads or tails. Okay, so if you were to guess what you think I'm, I'm going to get, what would you say? Tails. Okay, but you, just, but you just picked it randomly, right? You don't really believe I'm going to get a tails over a heads because it's 50-50. Yeah. Right? Okay. Now, if on the other hand, I were to flip the coin 10 times and you had to guess as to how many heads you think I'm going to get, what is the most likely number for a fair coin flip 10 times? Intuitively. Uh, it, it it compounds, but. Well, what do you think? I mean, if I flip a coin 10 times, it could be anything from zero heads to 10, ten to ten heads, right? Yeah. So what do you think is the most likely outcome amongst those numbers, zero to 10? Five. 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 
All right, five heads, five tails seems to be the most likely scenario. Why? Because there are more ways of getting five heads and five tails than there are of getting any other combination. For example, how many ways are there of getting 10 heads? Only one way, and that's if all of them are heads. How many ways are there of getting five heads? Well, it could be the first five coins, the first four and the sixth, the first four and the seventh, the first four and the eighth, the first four and the ninth. There's lots of ways of getting five heads, more than any other possibility. Now, if I flipped a coin 10 times and I got zero heads, if not a single head came up, would I conclude that the coin was not fair or that there's some other factor in play? Or would I say, wow, that's a rare occurrence but sometimes rare events occur. Wow, well, that's a rare occurrence, but sometimes rare events occur. Okay. What if instead I flipped the coin a hundred times and I got heads every single time out of a hundred flips? I feel like you're cheating at that point. Well, okay. So is it possible to get a heads a hundred times in a row? It's possible, but like... But what? Rare events occur. Yeah. Okay, rare events occur. So let me ask you a question. How long do you think, let's, let's assume that you can flip 100 coins at once. You just throw 100 coins up into the air. And let's suppose it takes you, let's say, uh, 30 seconds, or not even that, 15 seconds to check if they're all heads, and if not, to recollect them and try again. How long would you have to throw these coins up recollect, throw, recollect, throw, and so on, before you would see 100 heads at the same time? A lot. A lot. How long? Uh, 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 an hour? A day? A week? Huh? It, it depends. It could be like the first time. It could be like the thousandth time. You 100%. It, it, it could be the first time. It could be the first time. It's a, it's a rare event to create. Yes, but in this case, it's so rare that you would more than likely have to spend more time than the entire age of the universe before it occurs. That's true. Okay, now, if something is that rare and it actually happens, would you say rare events occur or would you say more than likely there's a reason why it happens. Not, that, not, yeah. not definitively, but more than likely. Yeah. Okay. Think of the following. Maybe, maybe that's not even uh, so obvious. How about the following? Imagine you have a container full of a gas, some kind of you know substance. It's the molecules of the gas are, are flying around. Now, these molecules, there's lots of them. Avogadro's number. Who here knows chemistry? Well, lots of molecules, right? There's lots of molecules in this, in this container. And these molecules are bouncing back and forth and hitting each other and ricocheting and rotating and, and, and vibrating and all this kind of stuff. Is it possible at some snapshot in time for every one of those gas molecules to be on the left side of the container and have none at all on the right side? Yes. Okay. If it actually happened, would you be surprised? Yes. Yes. Would you be so surprised as to say, okay, something's wrong here because this is no way this would have happened on its own? No. You think it could have happened on its own? Yes. Not, I mean, not, not possible, but if, if it actually, I'm not talking about mathematical possibilities here because in mathematics, you know, no matter how unlikely, it's still a possibility. I'm talking about a practical possibility you would question it you'd be like what what's causing it to happen right that's that's probably your response correct something must be going on here for this to happen anahit do you agree with that yeah Even though, which, yeah yeah which you're taking the snapshots which I, I, a reason, but. I, I you broke up there can you say that again please uh, i said it could be like the frequency at which you're taking like the pictures like the no, no, I, I know, but I'm saying it, this is a hypothetical example. So let's imagine that I can just freeze time for a split second and analyze every molecule in there. It's a, it's a, you can't actually do it, but let's just imagine that I could, that I can just freeze time 
and analyze every molecule. Would it be plausible for at some snapshot, every molecule to be on the left side of the container, all the gazillions of them that are in there? It's plausible. It's, it's, it's possible, but it's not plausible, okay. right? It's very unlikely to occur. So when, this is a, the most important result in this chapter, the most important idea in this chapter. Um, an observed effect, an observed effect so unlikely um, that it would rarely, that it would rarely, if at all, occur um, by chance is called a statistically significant result. Okay, a statistically significant result is one that is so unlikely that it would rarely, if ever, occur by chance alone. So for example, if I flip a coin a hundred times and I get 10 heads, it is so unlikely to have occurred by chance. That would be a statistically significant result. Now, as a result of that, what do I do? I would probably say the coin's not fair or at least claim that the coin is not fair. I can't prove anything, but I would claim that it's not fair. But if I did five flips and I got heads on all five, would I claim the same statistically significant result? No. No, because five, what's the chance of five heads and five flips? It's basically one in 32. That's a 3% chance, give or take. A 3% chance wouldn't expect it to occur, but if it did occur, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't start to question all of uh, everything that I've ever learned. If I, if I, if I had a gun that had a three percent chance of firing and asked you to play Russian roulette with it, you'd more than likely say no. But if I had a gun that had a one in a gazillion chance of firing, and I offered you a million dollars, I, I think many people would say yes. I'm not saying what you would say. I'm not going to say what I would say. Um, but if the chance of something happening is really, 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 really small, then you go through your life assuming that it's not going to occur. A statistically significant result is one that is so unlikely to occur by chance that if it actually did happen, we would really have to question uh, what's going on behind the scenes. And as we go through the rest of the book, it's going to be all about checking for statistical significance. Okay, that's the goal of uh, most of the statistics that we're going to do is, okay, I believe the mean of, uh, uh, of you know, the lengths of, of, of some object that I'm manufacturing in my laboratory, in my, uh, my warehouse, my, my factory is uh, seven inches long. So I take a sample of a hundred of them and I get 9.2 inches. If the average of my 100 size sample is 9.2, would I say, well, okay, so they're not all gonna be seven, but uh, the, the average can still be seven. Or would I say, okay, you're probably not making things the right length. Yeah, you probably question. I probably question whether they're really seven or not. But if I got 7.03 as my average, then I probably wouldn't question it because that's fairly close to seven. So is it a statistically significant result? And I say it's wrong and therefore I'm gonna recalibrate, I'm gonna rehire, I'm gonna retrain, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Or do I say, okay, it's not exactly what I would have expected, but it's within the realm of plausibility and therefore I'm not gonna question it. Okay, this is the majority of what the remainder of this course is gonna be. But what do we have to do? We got a first study probability, which tells us why certain outcomes 
are, are likely. And then once we have the probability under our belts, then we can go back to statistics and learn about testing whether or not our hypotheses are correct and checking them against what we expect from probability and then drawing conclusions from them. That's a lot of fun, I think so at least. And it's coming up shortly. So we just got to get through the rest of this chapter, which you know sucks to be honest. I don't like this chapter at all. Um, but we're almost done. So are there any questions on what we've done so far in this chapter? No. So far so good, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so now there's some other just definitions here we're going to throw in, just random definitions, which you should know. Um, a placebo. Hopefully you've all heard the word placebo before. It's a dummy treatment. What does that mean? It's dummy treatment. Oh, where you trick someone into thinking they have a treatment. Uh, I don't know if trick is necessarily yeah. the right word, but you, you make them think they're getting a treatment, uh, a legitimate treatment when they're actually not. Yeah. Um, but you're not really, I mean, when you do an experiment and you have a placebo, it's not really, you're not tricking them. You just, you're, you're, you want to make sure to test whether or not the, the treatment that you're, you're, you know, the drug or whatever is actually effective. So it's a viable process. Um, and some of them know that they're going to have a, uh, a placebo. So it's not, you know, you're not tricking them, but I, I guess I get what you're trying to say. Uh, what is a double blind experiment? Is it when both sides have a placebo? Well, if both sides have a placebo, then no one's getting anything, right? Yeah. Would it, would it be when um, both the experimenter and the people don't know who got what? Yes, when both the experimenter and subject do not know what treatment is given to each subject. How would that experiment work? Like, how would you do that? Um, well, suppose I'm testing a drug. Um, so what I can do is I could put the drug in 100 vials and put a placebo in 100 vials and then randomly mix up the vials and then inject 200 people. I don't know which person got which vial, correct? Yeah. Okay. That's a very simple way of doing it, but it, it, it shows you that it's certainly possible. Okay. And I'm sure you won't want to do it that way, exactly the way I described it, because at the end of the day, when the experiment is over, you're going to want to really know which people get which. But if you put a label on each vial, but don't know what, what, label, what the label means, so there might be some administrators behind the scenes who know what's going on, but you as the person actually doing the experiment might not know. Oh, okay then. Right, so there's certainly ways of, of, of doing it. And, and in fact, double blind experiments are the only methods that are, are really done for the FDA. You, you, can't, you can't do a non uh, double blind experiment and, and expect your results to mean anything. Um, so anyway, that's a double blind experiment, another definition. I'm just kind of going through the book and looking for uh, definitions here. Next one, a matched pair design. A matched pair design. Okay, is an experiment. A matched pair design is an experiment um, where each treatment is given to each subject or possibly similar subjects. So here's an example. Suppose I'm interested in whether or not, um, in whether or not it's easier to do a task with your right hand or with your left hand. So what is, this, what is a, a, a better way of determining whether there's a difference between your right hand or your left hand. Picking at random 100 people and having them use your right hands 
<clears throat> and then picking at random <clears throat> 100 people and having them using their left hands, or pick 100 people and have them do the experiment with the right hand and with their left hand. I mean, isn't it more likely that like most of those people are gonna be right-handed? Well, that's true. Um, so perhaps right-handedness versus left-handedness was a, was a wrong idea. How about this? Um, I'm trying to determine whether uh, just took my great example that I always use. So let me think of another example. Um, maybe like a, which sport is easier to play maybe? So, okay, which sport is easier to play? Okay, fine, which sport is easier to play? I'm gonna give people 10 minutes to learn how to play, how to shoot a basketball. And I'm gonna give people 10 minutes to learn how to hit a baseball. <clears throat> so, and, and, and the only condition is that you've never played basketball or baseball before, because obviously then you would know how to do it. Um, so I can pick 100 people to do basketball or 100 to do, to do baseball, or I can have the same 100 do both basketball and baseball. Because one of the factors that I have to worry about, one of the possible lurking variables is athleticism or uh, natural ability in this, in, in, in this particular arena. And if I pick the same people for basketball and baseball, it removes a possible lurking variable from the scenes. So both treatments, basketball and baseball, each subject is gonna do to remove another possibility of a lurking variable or confounding variables. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so it's called a matched pair design. And as we're gonna see in later chapters, um, the mathematics for matched pair designs is actually a little bit easier than the mathematics of uh, comparing two samples in general. Um, the formulas are on the calculator, so it really doesn't even make that much of a difference. But as we're gonna see, the, the process is a little bit different. Uh, the next one is a block design. <clears throat> a block design is kind of like a match pair design, but, but it, a little bit beyond it. A block design is the random assignment <clears throat> of treatments within, within blocks or um, within blocks or uh, sub collections within the population. So in other words, perhaps I might wanna treat men and women completely separately and not all randomize them together. I might set up two blocks, the women and the men and do a random assignment within the men and do a random assignment within the women. Maybe I wanna block them by age. Maybe, maybe I wanna block them by race. Maybe I wanna block them by um, uh, uh, first language learned or language spoken at home. There could be many reasons why you might wanna block within your population and treat each block as a random assignment within itself. Um, because again, different experiments call for different things. Okay, so I'm not saying you wanna do this every single time, but it's certainly a, uh, a viable method where you think the different blocks are so far apart that it would add a confounding variable to your data. So maybe like with the sports, like height would be like a block you might wanna do? Yeah, I mean, I mean for, certainly for playing basketball or for, for effectiveness on the court, as a general rule, height is, is paramount. I'm not necessarily sure it would, it would it would play a role with learning how to shoot a basketball necessarily. Um, you know, I played basketball in high school and I don't really remember taller people necessarily having an advantage for shooting just because they were a little, a little bit closer to the rim. But, uh, but maybe I was wrong. Or, may, or maybe that's what your experiment is. Maybe that's the whole idea of your experiment. Usually they're more, less coordinated, so it's kind of harder for them. To yeah, shoot. there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off there. You know, Shaquille O'Neal was like just the greatest free throw shooter of all time, right? So, you know, obviously yeah. tall people can shoot really, really well. Uh, anyways, that was a joke, but nobody got yeah. it. Okay. Hopefully everyone got it. Okay. So that takes us to the end of chapter nine.
And again, nine is a very qualitative, no math, just lots and lots and lots of um, definitions and words and stuff like that. But the real beginning of the math is now chapter 11. And this is introduction to probability. Now, probability is a lot of fun. You can do things in probability. You can, you can answer questions. You're dying. What are you dying about? Unless you're really dying, which is really awkward. Because this can be like the Monty Python scene where the guy was dying while actually carving you know, on the rocks. Oh, nobody gets it either. Yeah, I was. I remember for one of my classes, they wanted us to watch that movie, but I didn't end up watching it. You didn't end up watching it. Well, trust me, you didn't miss much. It was a, a really, really, oh, my shack joke. Well, thank you. Okay. That's my shack attack right there. Okay. Introduction to probability. So, probability is a lot of fun. And I'm going to start with a, an example, which um, is not in the book. Uh, at all. It just demonstrates that probability can be very unintuitive at times. But here's the question for you. Suppose you have a room and you have people in the room and you have lots of people. It's like a, a party going on. Lots of people in the room. How many people, how many people need to be, need to be in a room to have a 100% chance that two of them, two or more, have the same birthday. And by birthday, I don't mean year. I just mean day of the year. So I don't care what year you were born. I just care about the day of the year that you were born. So how many people need to be in a room to have a one 100% chance that two or more of them have the same birthday. Isn't this like an actual statistic that if you line up like 37 people, two of them are going to have the same birthday? No, but thanks for playing. But I, no, I, I swear that's true. I swear. I, I promise you it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise you it's not, but I know what you're trying to say, even though 37 is not the correct answer, but I know what you're trying to say. It's nowhere near there. <laughs> Well, we'll see. For now, answer my question. How many people need to be in a room to have a 100% chance that two or more have the same birthday? 367. 367. Do we agree? Do we agree? If you have 366 people, isn't it possible everyone has a different birthday? Yeah. So in order to be guaranteed a hundred percent that two of them or more have the same birthday, you need 367, right? 366 is each one. No, no, not 730, just 367. Where's 730 coming from? Oh, does the 66 one, have, the 366 one have to do with the leap year? Yeah, I mean, I mean, most people when they when they ask this question, they ignore the leap year. So most people would say 366, but because the leap year is technically a different day, I'm going to say 367. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, follow up question: How many people, at most, can be in a room to have? a 0% chance that two or more have the same birthday. Is it one? Answer is one. Because once you have that second person, then you already have a chance that two of them have the same birthday. Right? Yes. So those two questions were relatively easy to answer. This one how many people uh, need to be in a room to have a 50% chance 
that two or more have the same birthday. And so take a guess, either verbally or you put it in chat, how many people do you think need to be in a room for there to be a 50% chance that two of them have the same birthday? One hundred and eighty-four. Okay, one hundred eighty-four is a good guess. Anyone else? I can see why you guess one hundred eighty-four. It's halfway between zero percent and one hundred percent. Seems very reasonable. Anyone else want to make a guess as to how many people need to be in a room before there's a fifty percent chance that two of them have the same birthday? Even if it's wrong, I would love for everyone to say something so I know you're actually here. Four, three, three? Wait, wait, you're saying if there's three people in a room, then it's even money that two of them have the same birthday? No, but you wanted us to contribute. <laughs> no, I want you to guess, but I also want you to think about your guess. Oh. Don't, just, don't just randomly put a number in. I mean, I want you to think about it. 184, I get why he guessed 184 it's not right but i understand why he guessed that 34 <laughs> 34 is your guess okay anyone else um oh, two people the we still see have you heard this before have you looked it up before how do you get to 23 you looked, oh, it, up. 20. You looked it up didn't you yeah I, I looked it up you looked it up. What a cheater. All right. So the answer is 23. If you have 23 people in a room, you have a roughly 50% chance that two of them have the same birthday. It's not at all obvious why it should be that way. But with basic probability, basic, you know, like a couple of rules of probability that all make sense, you can actually derive that mathematically. So there's some really unintuitive results, but some really amazing things that you can do with probability. It's a lot of fun. I mean, uh, one of my favorites is a question. If you have a lined paper with infinitely many lines, all the distance D apart from each other, and you take a needle of length L, and you randomly drop the needle on the paper, the question is, what is the probability that the needle does not touch one of the lines? This is called Buffin's needle problem. Ironically, Buffles, Buffin's needle problem and with just some basic laws of probability and some calculus, you can actually come up with an answer for this. I mean, some really great stuff from probability, a lot of fun. And it all starts with the basic axioms of probability. So the basic axioms of probability. I mean, you can get a PhD and, and focus all of your research on probability alone. It's a, it's a wonderful subject. I have some great books on it here. A lot of fun. Anyways, basic axioms of probability. One, if something is certain to occur, then the probability of its occurrence is what? What is the probability of an event that is certain to occur? 100%. 100%. 
which is just the number one. If something is impossible to occur, then the probability of its occurrence is what? Zero percent. Zero percent or zero. So as a result, all probabilities are between what two numbers? Zero and one. Are between zero and one. All probabilities are between zero and one. When I see on a test a question about probability and somebody's answer is not between zero and one, I love seeing it because I can give them zero points and not even look for partial credit. Because if you say that the likelihood of an event is not between zero and one, it demonstrates you have no idea what you're talking about. I don't love it in the sense that I want my students to fail. I love it in the sense that it's very easy to grade a problem like that, okay? If it's not between zero and one, it is wrong definitively because you can't have more likelihood than 100% of occurring and you can't have less likelihood than 0% chance of occurring. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So um, a way to paraphrase this last one, so IE, for any event E, the probability that E occurs is between zero and one. So we have a notation for probability, for likelihoods, the probability of an event E must be between zero and one. That is essentially our first rule of probability. Okay, questions on that so far? Yes, no, maybe so? No. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, definition. A random experiment is one in which the outcome is not known in advance, but all possible outcomes are. Can somebody give me an example of a random experiment? Pulling out a marble from a from a bag, and all three of the color, all three of the colors are red, blue, and white, and it's only three marbles. So there's three marbles in the bag, yeah. red, blue, and white, and you're gonna pull out a marble, and you don't know what color it is. Yeah, and then you know you know the possibilities of each one occurring. Okay. Okay, certainly that's a random experiment because we know the possible outcome, but we don't know what we're going to get. Uh, anything else, anyone? Uh, is the flipping the coin one another one? Flipping a coin is a wonderful one. If you flip a coin, we know it's going to be heads or tails, but we don't know which one it is in advance. That's a wonderful example. Anything else? A roulette table. Roulette table. Okay, one through 38. Red, blue, I'm oh, sorry, red, black, possibly green. Don't know in advance. Card from a deck, a die, whether it rains fantasy tomorrow, football. huh? Well, like fantasy football, because of the probability that you will know like what team will win at the end. Any 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 sporting events, one hundred percent. Whether someone's going to have a boy or a girl. Um, I mean, there's there's any situation. 
where the outcome is not known in advance is called a random experiment, as long as all possible outcomes are known. So the sample space, the sample space of a random experiment is the collection S of all possible outcomes. So for example, if I flip a coin, then what is S? If I flip a coin, what is S? Uh, heads or tails? Heads or tails. If I roll a die, what is S? One through six. One through six. If I have a child, what is S? Male or female? Um, yes, I know that in theory, if I flip a coin, it can land on its edge. If I roll a die, it can land on a corner. If I have a child, it can be... Uh, um, <laughs> What's it called? Is it cross sex or some? It's when they have like. Yeah, both male and female genitalia. Yeah. I don't know. What, I forget what it's called. But there's always the possibility. But if we ignore those really intersex, if we ignore those really rare situations and just keep it simple, then these are the sample spaces for these various experiments. If I if I pick a card from a deck, if I pick a card, what is my sample space? Are you picking for like a specific card or like? Well, what I'm interested in and what I hope to get doesn't matter when it comes to the sample space. The sample space are the possible outcomes. It should be one through 10 and then uh, J, J, Q, K. One <laughs> through 10. You don't play with cards much, do you? Oh, it's one through nine. Wow. So you have the ace of diamonds is one possibility and the two of diamonds all the way through the king of diamonds. And then you go all the way to the king of, let's say hearts, you know, and so on. Maybe I shouldn't have picked cards. When I was a kid, we always played with cards, but I guess it's not really a thing anymore. Or is it, do you guys know about cards too much? I've actually had people who have never, never, ever, ever played with cards. I've played with cards, but I haven't played with cards in a while, so. Gotcha. Yeah. So growing up, we didn't have, you know, the internet like you guys have today and, and all these uh, things to do with our spare time. So back then we actually spent lots of time just sitting around playing cards. We had a really boring existence. But anyways, so the sample space is, you know, all 52 cards in the deck. What is the probability for any experiment of getting something in the sample space? be 100 percent right it's 100 percent because the sample space is every possible outcome by its very definition the sample space is every possible outcome which means the probability of getting something in the sample space has to be 100 percent because you are guaranteed to have something in the sample space that is its very definition so the probability of getting something in the sample space is equal to one this is property number two of probability now, for a given experiment, for a given random experiment, two events are disjoint if they cannot occur at the same time. I would have written simultaneously, but I don't know how to spell it. So at the same time. For a given random experiment, two events are disjoint if they cannot occur at the same time. In general, the word disjoint even more so in just in, math, in, in the world is when two things can't happen at the same time. 
Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Say again. Was it a question? I I, I didn't hear that. Oh, he said yes, sir. I said oh. yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're talking about okay. So, yeah, what he said. Okay. So, give me an example of two events of two situations that cannot occur simultaneously. Uh, flipping one coin and getting both heads and tails. <laughs> flipping a coin and getting both heads and tails. That's a great example. Great example. So, if events A and B are disjoint, then what is the probability of A or B occurring? What is the likelihood that A or B occurs? Oh, 100%. Well, just because they're disjoint doesn't mean that between them, they're everything. So for example, if I'm rolling, a, if I flip a, a die, and event A is getting an odds, and event B is getting a two, uh, then A and B are disjoint, but there's not everything. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just depends on like the other variables. Cause like, if, if let's say that like for that example, there's a lot of different possibilities, but like if you flip the heads or tails, there's really only two possibilities of heads or tails. hundred percent. So what I'm looking for here is a formula that I can apply to every situation. Um, let me think. I'm looking for a formula that applies to every situation. So the answer is, if they're disjoint, what I can do is I can compute them separately and then add them together. The likelihood of A or B occurring is equal to the likelihood that A occurs plus the likelihood that B occurs. Let's do an example to illustrate that. Um, so roll a die. 50, 50. Well, A is one, uh, three, or five. It's getting an odd number. And B is getting a two. So what is A or B? What would be in the collection A or B? Uh, if A is 50%. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Not, not looking for numbers here yet. Not looking for probabilities. It'd be one, two, three, five. I'm just looking for what is A or B, right? If A is one, three, five, and B is two, then A or B is one, two, three, five. Do we agree with that? Yes. So then what is the probability of A or B? What is the likelihood of getting A or B? Right. How much is it? 0.66%. So four to six or 66%, right? And what's the probability of getting A? 50%. And what's the probability of getting B? Uh, six. So or, is this formula satisfied in this case? Yes. Do you see how intuitively it seems like it might be a formula that applies in all the situations? Yes. Anahit, what about you? Yeah, yes, yes. That seems to make sense, right? So this is a basic, this is basic rule number three. Basic rule number one was that all probabilities are between zero and one. Basic rule number two, the probability of the sample space has to be one. And if events A and B are disjoint, the probability of one or the other is just equal to the probability of one plus the probability of the second. Okay. And then basic rule number four, uh, what is the probability that event A does not occur? Now the book uses, uh, they don't even say it. So this notation is A does not occur, a bar, sometimes written as a prime, sometimes written as a complement, 
So there's multiple notations for A does not occur. So what is the probability that A does not occur? It'd be equal to the probability of every uh, everything else occurring. Well, okay. So let's say it's a forty percent chance that A does not occur. So, so it'd be like the probability. So it'd be like a hundred percent minus the probability of everything else occurring. Yes. Awesome. The probability that A does not occur is one minus the probability that A does occur. Very good. Very, very nice. These are the four basic rules of probability, <clears throat> and it is shocking the conclusions one can draw just from these four alone. In fact, the problem earlier with the, um, the birthdays. <sighs> Ooh, excuse me can actually be done with just these four properties. You don't need to develop anything else. Very, very cool stuff. So are there any questions with anything that we've done so far? We're gonna uh, finish this next time. I'm gonna stop here a little early just because I'm tired, my voice is hurting. Um, I got a headache and I have to watch Ted last song. But other than that, um, are there any questions with anything that we've done so far today? No. No, thank you. Okay, so remember the homeworks are extended. You have some time. We're gonna have a quiz this coming weekend. Let's pick a good chapter to have the quiz on. So, um, this one. You, like, you like this? Already you like this one? Or I can do this one next week. I don't know. Cause I mean, if you want it, I can do it on this one because the last few chapters are just very wordy stuff. Um, I don't know, you guys tell me. I'll tell you what, you guys decide next time what chapter you want it on and I'll, I'll put up a quiz on that chapter. I don't even care what chapter, but we'll have a democratic, um, you know, well, process, votes and you guys decide what chapter and I'll, I'll do a quiz on that one. Okay, okay. all right. Everyone, I will see you on Thursday.